I'm incredibly proud uh, to uh, give the opening remarks here, um, and that's because uh, this exhibition is the work of many, many people. Um, uh, me, but also, um, uh, <laughs> also uh, the, the wonderful team that I work with and indeed the artists themselves, some, um, what, 50 or 20 of whom will be here over the course of the next two days. Um, and what we're providing here is the kind of um, forum for uh, direct interaction that all too often goes um, unavailable to the general public. What we want is to spark conversation and discovery both here and then next to the artwork um, and uh, to have these conversations carry forward as we move through the next two days. And indeed, when you go back to your homes or back to the cities from which you came, um, and to those of you who uh, came from further afield, welcome. And if it's your, how many of you is it your first time at Crystal Bridges? I just would, oh my dear goodness. <laughs> so let me be among the first, I'm, I wouldn't be among the first. You got welcomed when you came in the door, or maybe when you landed at XNA Airport. Um, we love to welcome new folks to the area and to introduce you to what we're doing here because let me tell you something, it's exciting. Um, so the general rubric that we're talking about here uh, is uh, the artist and environment. Now, um, as far as these uh, sorts of symposia and, um, and series of talks go, you have to give a kind of general rubric under which you operate, otherwise not everybody can really fit, right? So artist and environment is general enough that it gives us a kind of um, leeway uh, a, a kind of uh, interpretive framework in which to sort of shuck and jive. And so you'll see us pushing up against it as, as we move through here. Um, there are three iterations of the interaction between the artist and that generalized environment that I'd like to touch on here in these opening remarks. And uh, they are provisional, um, and yet they are necessary. So here they are. There are three iterations of uh, an interaction here, one being the artist and the community, the environment of the community, uh, two, the artist and the environment of the studio, the, uh, the native habitat of the artist, if you will, and uh, three, the artist and the natural world. Now, um, it m might seem uh, somewhat silly to begin with this, but begin with this I must. This is a, uh, a cornerstone of the collection here at Crystal Bridges, and indeed, uh, the place that I come back to uh, when I'm uh, feeling somewhat lethargic and, and, uh, and tired at, at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday, um, I get out of my seat, I go downstairs, and then I head right across the way over there into our gallery uh, two. And uh, that's where I reach a kind of communion, again, with our mission. And to remind you of that mission uh, here at Crystal Bridges, uh, just to, so that we're all on the same page, it's to welcome all, to celebrate the American spirit in a setting that unites the power of art with the beauty of nature. Now, each of those tenets is incredibly important to us here, and we talk about it constantly. It's, it's sort of uh, the, the constant refrain in my brain. And even when I get away with emails and I'm consumed with phone calls and meetings and my iPhone is buzzing, if I can put all that away and step back to this, I'm brought back to center. The work you're looking at, in case you haven't seen it yet, in, uh, in the context of the galleries, is Asher B. Duran's Kindred Spirits from 1849, a kind of uh, uh, raison d'etre for, uh, for this institution. We're so happy and proud to house it within our walls and it speaks directly to what we do, and indeed the reason why we're convened here today. So um, if you think about those three rubrics I talked about, the, uh, the community as an environment, the studio as an environment, and the natural world as an environment, it's crystallized in this picture, just as it's crystallized in uh, three case studies that I'll touch on briefly from the State of the Art exhibition. Um, and my goal in starting with this picture is to demonstrate that there's a kind of continuity of the American spirit that extends from this sort of uh, glorious moment of possibility in the middle of the 19th century, a time when it seemed like the old world order of, uh, of old Europe had really passed, and it was time for a new place to take up the reins. That possibility of the American story is inherent to this picture. It's also, I would argue, inherent to state of the art. 
Now, look here at, at, uh, at the picture, and forgive me for the facsimile. You'll just have to get your butts up and go to the gallery after this and see it in person, because it's much better. Um, but to talk a little bit about this, uh, this picture with respect to the uh, community as an environment. A little bit of historical background. Uh, Asher B. Durand, uh, part of the uh, great Hudson River School, technically the first great school of American painting, uh, the history books tell us. And uh, you can see in this picture that there are uh, two men at the center of it. Uh, one, Thomas Cole, the great father of Hudson River School. Uh, to his right, William Cullen Bryant, the great man of letters of the 19th century. And uh, these three men together were, um, were learned erudite men in, uh, in mid-19th century New York City, which is not the same place today that it was uh, back in the 19th century. In fact, all you have to do is go into our galleries and look at our Francis Guy painting of, uh, of Brooklyn, um, because it's situated where Dumbo is now, under the, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, which is just teeming with cutie little tea places and places you can get, you know, wood stone pizza. Um, that's not what Brooklyn looked like in the 19th century. And indeed, New York was uh, still developing, okay? Um, and so the artistic world was developing too. These three men, Asher B. Durand, Thomas Cole, and uh, William Cullen Bryant, were sort of part of the vanguard of creating a community in New York City. The three of them helped to found the National Academy of Design, which uh, still to this day remains a place where uh, you can get a premier training in uh, figure drawing and realistic representation in this country and in the world. Um, but that crystallization around uh, these three men and their circle was a demonstration of the ways in which artists in the United States have always been a part of their community and interacting with it. Two, the studio is, a, is, a, is an interesting place to sort of jump off with this picture because uh, Asher B. Durand, uh, unlike uh, his forefathers, uh, like Thomas Cole, um, was very much um, an advocate for getting out of the studio. He wanted to paint on plein air. He wanted to uh, paint in the context of the natural environment because he felt that it was more true to the natural source from which his pictures came. So his relationship to the studio and in the environment was a lot more fluid than uh, his previous generation here in the United States. Thomas Cole would go out into the landscape in the Catskills because you have to remember, they painted the West, but the West for them was west of New York City. Right, so we're not talking about California, Phoenix, we're talking about the Catskills, okay? Um, so he, uh, he would go out into the Catskills, Thomas Cole, take his sketches and, and you know, spend a day, and then he would bring all of that back to his studio where then he, would, he would then compose his final paintings. Asher B. Durand said, no, that's not the way to do it. There's a kind of truth to representation of being in a place, of being part of a place, and that argument to him was a really important part of his artistic practice. Thinking too about the natural world, these two men, and I should mention that this is a kind of memorial picture, okay? So uh, Thomas Cole had died in 1848, and this picture was uh, commissioned by, um, by Jonathan Sturgis, um, a part of this circle as well. And uh, you can see, well you can't see, but I promise, just trust me, you don't know me yet, but you will. Um, there's uh, an inscription on this tree that, uh, that memorializes uh, Cole and Bryant, and uh, there's a kind of circle around it. And then here you can see there's a bird heading off into the horizon, there's another one here, and then another one in the, uh, the tree, representing these three men and their great friendship. Now the natural world and its ties to art are endemic to this picture, and um, indeed they're endemic to the place that we are in. You're sitting, on a bridge designed by Moshe Safdie, okay? And uh, we're in the context of uh, the rolling hills of the Ozarks, uh, which is essentially uh, the hills that uh, Alice Walton and her family called home. Home. This is a place that you return to. This is a place that uh, continuously evolves and yet stays strangely the same, okay? And the natural world is important to what we do here. In fact, it's written into our mission so um, here, in the context of this picture, you see two great men of the 19th century having a conversation about who knows what. The representation doesn't tell us. It could be poetry, it could be art, it could be nature, it could be uh, life and death, and it's probably all, and it's meant to represent all of it. And that's what we seek to do here at Crystal Bridges, to set the stage for conversation and discovery in the context of art and nature. 
The three iterations of environment that I'm talking about here are also um, represented in the works of art that uh, I visited um, in the thousand studio visits, which by now you've probably seen this whole process, right? We were on CBS Sunday morning this past week, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, my mom is really excited. She put it on her Facebook with a bunch of smileys, so that's, that, that's how I know. Um, so you know by now um, that we, we visited 1,000 studios across this country, and 102 artists ultimately are in the show. Um, and uh, I continuously correspond, too, with a, a number of the other 900. Um, and as I mentioned, a good portion of those are here today and tomorrow. Um, ultimately, uh, what you get is a kind of uh, picture, one picture of any number of possible pictures of the state of American art today. Um, I want to, uh, to begin a, a kind of brief discussion and case study about the artist in the environment as it particularly iterates in three of these artists who actually won't be here with us. So I'm hoping to sort of elevate their voices and add them to the conversation. I'll begin with uh, Vanessa German. Many of you may be familiar with Vanessa German's work by now, but she's an incredible artist and advocate for her community, her local community in Homewood, Pittsburgh, one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the United States for black-on-black -black crime. Um, Vanessa, for me, crystallizes the idea of uh, the artist environment as being that of the community. So uh, when I drove up to Vanessa German's studio, uh, her, uh, whereas the rest of the uh, houses on the street were dilapidated and in disrepair, her house was bursting forth with flowers and uh, color and signs planted in the yard that said, stop shooting, we love you. For Vanessa German, her artistic practice is uh, part and parcel and embedded within her community experience. She is a linchpin and a node for her community because she sits on her front porch and makes this artwork. She can't do it in her uh, basement anymore because it's too filled with the crap you see here, shells and stuff that she sourced from thrift stores and junk shops. And uh, so it's pushed her out onto her porch and for the better because when she starts creating, people come up to her and say, Miss Vanessa, what are you doing? And she says, get over here. It becomes a beginning point for a conversation. She takes these, uh, these statues uh, onto the bus. The bus stop is right outside of her house. She plunks it down on the seat next to her. This thing is this tall, okay? Um, and inevitably, you cannot help when you're in the context of Vanessa German and one of these objects to say, hey, what's that? And that becomes the beginning point of a conversation about community responsibility and our uh, individual rights and uh, the ways that we can work together to problem solve within the context of the community. Vanessa German is a powerful advocate for that. And you'll see a number of the voices that come to the table uh, at uh, the lectures and the uh, panels to follow that there are other artists in, in the community that work exactly in the same way. Uh, I'd also like to talk about um, a couple of other uh, artists here. The, um, the concept of the studio as an environment um, is a really tricky one. So um, if you think back to, say, I don't know, Jackson Pollock, and the way that uh, Pollock was shot by, uh, uh, famously by photographer Hans Namath and his sort of dancing and dripping, and um, there's a kind of mythology to that, right? That the, that the artist studio is a place of discovery and and, and invention, and it's, and it's sacred, and we can't really know what happens. That's actually not the case, okay? Uh, artist studios are real places where real work happens, uh, and they're often very happy to have you in that environment. I found that uh, a thousand times. Um, and so, for instance, uh, Colin and Shania, who will speak later, uh, works progress right here in the front row. When, when I walked into their studio, it was really just a, a, a meeting space in the front part of their, of their house, um, a place that serves as a kind of node for the community, a place where they take meetings for their, uh, their practice. And, uh, and for me, that was a, an important moment. Um, for an artist like Hamilton Poe, a young artist working right outside of Detroit, the studio is a place uh, that both is inward looking and constantly looks out. It's a place that is dynamic and ever-changing, and it's partly because the studio is falling apart. So uh, he's working in, a, in the warehouse district um, uh, near downtown Detroit, and I visited him in the dead of winter. This, by the way, was the worst winter to, to plan this thing, uh, the, all the travel, so um, I blame my boss. Anyway, um, 
So uh, I visited Detroit, I visited his studio, I walked up uh, several flights of steps and uh, came into his space. And he had set up uh, half of what you see here. So uh, his ceiling was, uh, could only accommodate six of these. These are, uh, the work is called Stack. You'll see it in gallery, uh, in the North Gallery of State of the Art. And um, it consists of box fans that are on and then on top of each of those box fans sits a mini sombrero that holds a number of eggs. And they are spinning as if by magic in equilibrium. So I walked into his studio and I saw this thing. I had no idea what to do with it. I, 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 I had no vocabulary for it. What is this, I said. He said, oh, I'm not quite sure yet. It was a place of, uh, of discovery, of, um, of, of not yet understanding. And, um, and he showed me another, a number of other projects, too, that were not yet realized, um, but were in a really interesting place. So um, in the previous week, so much snow had come down on the, uh, the roof of his, uh, his warehouse that it had literally fallen in under the weight of the snow. Now, a number of his studio mates, their work was ruined. Uh, it was soaked through with water and snow and grit and dirt and just the grime of Detroit. And rather than, and a number of uh, Hamilton's drawings were messed up too. And rather than you know, get angry and say, I'm quitting this place, I'm going elsewhere where it's easier and where it's safer, he made a response uh, to, this, to this work, uh, to this happening. Um, and, uh, sorry, we'll skip that for the moment. And um, I'd like to show you a bit of it. Uh, it is, uh, it was a sonic response. I called it a kind of, when I talked to him, I said it was an object situation. Um, he had set up this uh, speaker, and he had wrapped it in saran wrap underneath the dripping that was coming directly from the ceiling into his space. And every time the, uh, the drop that was leaking from the roof hit uh, the, the stretched saran wrap, it uh, uttered a sound. He had, he had uh, backwards hooked up his, his headphones um, to release a sonic um, electronic pulse that he then manipulated um, and it created a sound within the space. The sound was irregular, it was momentary, it was fleeting, it was beautiful. And uh, that melting mass of snow and ice, which could have been an icon of uh, difficulty, a place where he uh, could have come uh, in anger, he found a sense of possibility. developed into a work called Taps. That's Han, right there at the uh, makeshift DJ booth that he created. So out of this destruction of his, you know, supposedly sacred space of the studio, he found uh, a space for making, a space for beauty. So um, as we continue to think about the artists in their environment, let's think about the studio and its various iterations, because it iterates differently for the artists that are here today. And I'd be interested to see the way that that thread connects. Uh, finally, I'll talk about uh, the natural world. Um, and the ways in which uh, artists uh, are interacting with the natural world in um, new and innovative ways. Uh, here, uh, Pam Longabardi, Atlanta-based artist, uh, as part of her practice, uh, culls the world over for um, these uh, winding gyres of plastic trash that accumulate as a result of our um, sort of wanton consumption, okay? So, for, uh, for Pam, she is a constant reminder. I mean, she told me the second we walked into her studio, every piece of plastic that's ever been made still exists. Don't ever take a straw, she said to me. <laughs> I try not to. So um, for Pam, this sort of, um, this mounting evidence of the destruction of our world becomes the kind of wellspring for inspiration and discovery here in uh, Ghost of Conception for Pete M, she is uh, culling these, uh, these bastions of trash that live at the extremities of the earth, 
and Hawaii and Alaska, uh, surrounding the islands of the Pacific. She culls them, gathers them up with teams, and brings them back to her studio in Atlanta, which is just a trash heap. I mean, it's disgusting, right? Um, but she culls through those things and um, finds a kind of sense of order. Um, here she's referencing the history of modernist painting. Uh, Pete Mondrian did a number of drawings that directly reference uh, a dock leading into the sea or a lake. Uh, so here she's referencing the history of modernism and the ways in which the modernist project in fact fails to acknowledge the actual lived reality of the world outside. And here in her paintings of uh, chemical reactions on top of copper, she's literally documenting what's happening in the natural world and natural processes and allowing them to unfold under her hand, creating sort of atmospheric effects of uh, light and, and color. So these three rubrics are sort of, um, they're just propositions, uh, ways of jumping off the community, the studio, the natural world, three environments that artists inhabit today and uh, that you'll see iterated differently in the different practices that we explore together. Um, but uh, thinking back to Asher V. Durand, it's uh, a kind of interaction that uh, has continued through the American story uh, since its inception. Thanks very much uh, for paying attention and I'll take a few questions, a little Q&A here if you don't mind. How we navigated through, the, the, the kind of, uh, and, and culled down and, and, and curate, yeah, uh, that's, that's a longer discussion. <laughs> but I will say, so the, the spaces here at, at Crystal Bridges uh, dictated it in a, in a certain way. I mean, these beautiful Moshe Safdie designed spaces beg for a kind of uh, sensitivity and rhythm. So you'll notice when you walk through the, the first gallery of state of the art that there's a kind of bombast and movement and life and noise and cacophony. Um, that was purposeful. I wanted there to be a kind of explosion um, and a, a, a welcome uh, uh, and a wrapping uh, around the viewer in a way. And the second half becomes more contemplative. When we were looking through the, uh, when we were visiting artists and deciding which to include, um, we were after a few criteria, which you can read in the catalog, and I won't rehash here. Um, but suffice it to say, uh, the impulse was to, um, was to demonstrate that contemporary art in the United States can speak, can communicate to an audience, even if that audience might not have uh, a degree in art history to, uh, to help them out. Um, and so that's one way of, uh, of curating a show like this, right? Uh, this is not the be all end all, in fact, it's the beginning point of many more conversations to come. This, the, the exhibition is a, is a bit of a provocation. It's meant to be a disruption. Um, and um, that might uh, surprise you or it, it might give you cause uh, for, um, for reflection, but um, it's meant to be um, a kind of disruption in the way that uh, art is understood and presented in this country. And um, whether it achieves that or not is, I think, open for discussion. Right now, uh, there's a website called Temporary Art Review, Temporary Art Review, run by a guy named James McNally, and he has uh, sort of brought together what he calls a social response to state of the art. Um, responding to the fact that uh, the criticism of the show has essentially failed to, uh, to wrap around the, the scope and the mission uh, of what we were after, and that in fact a multivocal response to what we are doing is a more apt response because it's in the mode of how we're operating here. So um, there was a kind of editorial presentation and then I had a statement there and then I believe uh, Shanai uh, from Works Progress next week will be included in that conversation. It's a kind of, um, uh, it's, it's organic and free flowing, much like the exhibition itself which doesn't really fit with any defined parameters. So the discussion that moves forward from here is one that includes many voices. And indeed, uh, I, as Sarah mentioned, those voices are here in the room. It's not a conversation for another day. It's for today. Um, so I, I invite you to take seriously the, um, the conversations as they develop because um, I'll be right there with you.